So hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand and I welcome you to this series called RBI 24/7. So as most of you would be knowing that in this series we discuss a set of five questions which relate to finance and economics current affairs. So if you are preparing for competitive exams, this video can be useful to you, right? So let's not waste any time and move straight away to the session. But before doing that, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. <coughs> So those of you who are coming to our video for the very first time, do not forget to subscribe to our channel. It can help you to get associated with us and pressing this bell icon will help you to get notified whenever a new video comes up, right? You can also join our telegram group. On this group, you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. After that, Okay, here is your question number one, which says which one of the following statement tells you correctly about the meaning of Asian premium. So Asian premium, this term has been in news. A very simple question, five statements given to you. You have to select the correct option and the correct option is option D. <coughs> so option D means it is the extra charge that is collected by OPEC that is organization of petrol exporting countries from Asian countries while selling oil to them as compared to the Western countries. So let's try to understand this in a simple way. I think we all are aware that what does OPEC do? OPEC sells oil. It is nothing but a group of countries who sell oil to the entire world, right? So now, when they sell oil to Asian countries like India, China, Japan, they charge a higher price as compared to when they sell this to, they sell oil to Western nations or European West, like UK or Euro, sorry, like US or European nations, right? So this seems like a bit of contrast because they are charging higher price from the eastern part of the world which is considered relatively poorer as compared to the western to their western counterparts right so now we have to understand that why is there existence of this asian premium or why does opec tries to charge a higher price out of asian nations right because uh, Asian countries like India and China, they are huge customers for OPEC as they buy a lot of oil, right? India imports a lot of oil. So, okay, now for talking about that why is there existence of Asian premium? So, see, first of all, countries like Saudi and Gulf states or Kuwait, they supply a high level of oil exports to US and European nations to maintain market share for political objectives. So this is the keyword here, the political objectives. That means since they want to establish good relationships or they want to keep, they want to get in the book, good books of Western nations and their governments, that is why they try to woo them with the help of providing them some discounts as compared to the Asian nations. So, uh, in a correct sense, this Asian premium is more like a North Atlantic discount in which uh, the Western nations are getting a cheaper price as compared to the Asian counterparts, right? So, for maintaining political objectives. So, so that, see, when a stronger nation is, uh, is a good friend to you, see, we, in school or colleges, we all try to uh, be friends with someone who is very good at studies or someone who is very popular because if you try to, if, if you get associated to such type of person, uh, it, it, there are chances that you, then you can also attain their qualities or you can get some benefit out of it, right? So that is why if these countries, they, they stay in the good books of uh, these Western nations, then they would have military support in case things go bad or in case there is any need for it, right? So presumed benefits of military and political support in conduct of international relations, right? 
Okay, so Asian premium more like North Atlantic discount. So exporters view any financial losses from the regional allocations as an insurance premium for perceived political risk coverage. So this is a very important point that see obviously these oil exporting nations they are facing a, they are giving a discount that means they are facing some loss but they are they are not looking at it like a loss they are thinking of it as an insurance premium or as an uh, or as a as a bribe or you can say as an incentive which is being provided for these nations to maintain good relations with them right for insurance premium for perceived political risk coverage that so that in case there is any problem in their countries they can go to these countries and ask for help right after that it has also been argued that regulatory barriers in asian energy markets can be one of the factor that means that um, markets energy markets in these asian countries it is it is restricted as compared to the western nations that is why asian nations they try to lap up as much as oil as they can as a security because see oil is something which 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 is a driving factor for the economy right so most of uh, prices of most of the goods and services they are dependent upon the oil prices right so they try to have a good stock of oil as a security that in case there is any problem uh, they are, they can get their they can keep their economies going on right so if they want to maintain a good stock of oil they are willing to pay premiums for exporting huge for, for importing huge quantities of oil right so they are willing to pay higher prices than their counterparts in europe and us and one more point here is that in us the development of shale gas which 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 acts as an alternative to oil has also been one factor so see in us if there is development of shale gas then obviously they they would be needing lesser oil and they would be importing lesser uh, oil from opec so opec in order to uh, retain their customers in order to keep their customers keep preventing uh, them from using shale gas they they try to provide them with discounts right so this play between oil and shale gas we have discussed it in one of the session when we discussed about oil prices or uh, prices of oil futures going into negative right so i hope you remember that we discussed how shale prices also uh, get affected in midst of that right so india has been coordinating with asian countries to raise their voice against this asian premium charged by opec so india has been one of, india has been protesting against it and they want this to get rid of this asian premium so that asian countries can also get competitive prices right moving ahead okay here is a second question for today which says which of the following companies would spike the interest of an investor who wants to engage in esg investing so this is a term which is getting very popular nowadays and it was asked by one of you in the comments uh, they, uh, that person wanted me to take up esg bonds right so you have to tell which of the following companies are going to spike the interest or or are going to attract an investor who wants to go get into esg investing moving ahead to the solution and the solution say is option e option e means 1 3 and 4 so before talking about these points let us first understand what is meant by esg investing so obviously i think you can make it up that it is an abbreviation abbrevi abbreviation for what e for environment s for social responsibility and g for i think it seems something related to government yes it is governance or corporate governance right so uh, so basically investing into firms who are into all the who are into one of these sectors or more of them basically if a company is producing some environment friendly products or they are doing something to protect the environment then it comes under this preview so it is a point or it is a type of investing under the social investing right so we have studied many 
of these types we have studied impact investing we have studied thematic investing we have learned about social imp impact bonds right so you can say esg is something like that in which an investor wants to invest in a firm which is environment friendly or is into fulfilling their social responsibility and follows corporate governance right so this is esg right here you can see environment empathy melting glaciers rise in average temperature globally has brought before us the pitfalls of global warming although some people they do not accept that global warming exists but uh, uh, global warming is before us measures such as switching to renewable energy increasing green cover increasing green cover means planting trees afforestation better waste management and pollution treatment so companies obviously they are one of the uh, one of the greatest waste generators in the economy that is why it is their own responsibility to dispose of the waste especially chemical waste in such a manner that it does not cause any harm to the environment are all the ways in which one can protect the environment after it after that social responsibility corporates have taken up initiatives in protecting the environment so many companies they take up initiatives they donate some of their earnings to charitable causes or they run uh, schools for underprivileged children they run hospitals for uh, underprivileged sections of the society right so they take up they are so they take their social responsibilities seriously after that all of these paves way for enriching cycle for all the parties involved that means benefit for all the stakeholders so uh, there is some uh, there is some difference between a different school of thoughts because earlier it was believed that a business should only concentrate on earning profit because it is uh, one sole responsibility of business they they should not worry about uh, fulfilling the social responsibilities but later uh, it came to be in the view that since business is taking inputs from the society that is why it is its moral responsibility to take to be accountable for its actions corporate governance about integrity and honesty so doing business in an in, in a manner which is honest right uh, this aspect also has the potential to adversely impact investors wealth creation prospects in the long run so see if a company is not fall is not law compliant or if they are not following corporate governance norms they might make some short term gains but in the long term this is not going to be sustainable because that's not a sustainable model in long run they need to work in an honest manner in a manner which is respectful towards the laws of the country where they are operating right some companies comply with the requirements in letter and spirit there are others which comply only as a matter of compliance so it is important for the companies to in, to understand that why these norms are made what is the benefit so the benefit is to the company also in terms of building a goodwill uh, in the eyes of investors as well as their customers right and investors obviously whatever happens in stock markets it happens because of stock markets mood so it is very important to have a good image in the eyes of investors right so uh, the elements of ecg investing so basically uh, if we talk about es uh, sorry esg uh, if we talk about esg bonds it means the companies which are into all these se sectors if they uh, if they come out with fixed income securities like bonds then if an investor is investing into it then we can categorize it as an investment into esg bonds right i hope now you are clear with it so coming back to the statements first of all first statement says company engaged into developing cleaner modes of energy obviously it is going to be of interest for the investor after that brewing company not that much right because liquor especially in india uh, the liquor industry is not uh, considered very moral i think there was a recent uh, but if we talk about itc company obviously it, it is engaged into so many social responsibility deeds 
you can see different brands of their they are different brands talking about how they donate money to education of children underprivileged children right but still since it is originally a tobacco company so it had to get into these activities to change the image right so not a liquor company after that company which has law compliant female representation in their board of directors yes right after because following corporate governance norms after that company that helps underprivileged sections of the society to avail medical guidance after that company which has been in controversy for employing child labor obviously not because these two points points 2 and 5 they are having a bad impact on societies in 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 the eyes of investors right so any long term an investor who believes into esg investing might not be interested in these two so the correct answer is 1 3 and 4 moving ahead so there is a third question for today which says who popularized the term learning organization very simple question and the correct answer for this question is option b option b means peters singe so talking about learning organization i think the name is enough to tell you an organization which learns continuously is known as a learning organization here you can see basically an organization which is up for uh, adapting innovation or uh, being bringing out creative ideas to fulfill the needs of their customers and to improve their processes so obviously if a business needs if a business needs to survive they need profits for that for that they need efficient processes because the the manner in which they conduct their business needs to be cost efficient so they have to adopt technology for that they have to uh, get their employees motivated for that right so a learning organization which continuously learns facilitates the learning of its members and continuously transforms itself learns and encourages learning among its people promoting exchange of information so ensuring participation of employees because employees are the only people who can, employees are the only entities who can uh, who can bring innovation into the company right so uh, giving space to employees so that they can put their ideas forward and making people adaptable to new ideas and changes through a shared vision so shared vision is very important some characteristics of a learning organization provides continuous learning opportunities use learning to reach their goals so uh, they they might be making mistakes in the process but they have to learn they 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 have a tendency to learn from their mistakes and not making them in the journey ahead link individual performance with organizational performance since organizations performance is dependent upon the performance of its individuals or of its employees that is why it is important to link both of them right foster inquiry and dialogue making it safe for people to share openly and take risk not following the autocratic style of leadership but being more participative so that employees can be open and they can share their ideas how uh, how uh, doesn't matter how much weird it seems right embracing creative tension as a source of energy and a renewal so creative tension right so whenever we talk about conflict in an organization we take it in a negative sense that it's a bad thing it it discourages employees or has a negative impact on their morale right but conflicts are also very important because they in an organization there has to be people with different visions with different values with different ideas different thought processes right and whenever we work, they work together they are bound to collide but how you resolve that conflict so many a times many good ideas can come out of it come out of a conflict or come out of a creative tension so uh, harboring this creative tension into something which is innovative as a source of energy and renewal right are continuously aware of and interact with their environment so they are aware of their environment's need if the 
trends and preferences of their customers are changing they are aware of that so in an organization where employees are dull or they do not want to put up their ideas or they are more uh, like let the boss give us orders and we'll follow them and we are not going to uh, think on our own so in in such organizations it is important to it is important to practice these concepts of learning organization so this concept has been popular in 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 sense of india's manufacturing because i think we have discussed in many times how india is lacking into manufacturing sector it is not that much developed as compared to the service sector and it is one area it is one um, um, not entirely tapped area which has the potential to generate employment for many low skill workers right so it is important for those factories to be learning organization so that they can they can produce at lower cost then they can expand and generate employment in the economy so uh, if we connect this model of business management to economics it is relevant there also because if our organization if our factories would be uh, would be practicing this then they can produce better and efficiently right Moving ahead, here is your fourth question for today, which says, which shares are issued to to employees of a company for providing know-how or adding value to the organization? Moving ahead to the correct option, and the correct option is sweat equity shares. This was also a topic given by you guys in the comments, right? I hope now you understand what is the meaning of sweat equity shares. So see. the word the name tells you something in which sweat is involved or uh, when an employee works hard for the organization right so the sweat is synonymous with the uh, this is signaling towards the employee working hard dripping sweat for the organization right so whenever an employee is working really hard then uh, that employee is allotted some shares without uh, without taking any cash or without any monetary consideration those are known as sweat equity shares which are like a compensation to the employees right okay means equity shares issued by a company to its employees or directors at a discount or for a consideration other than cash generally it is consideration other than cash because it is assumed that whatever employee is doing for the company or they are working hard for the company that is the consideration for this uh, for issuing these type of shares so issuing of sweat equity shares allows the company to attract and retain its employees by rewarding them for their contribution right a company can issue sweat equity shares only after 1 year from the date of its commencement of business so the company should be at least 1 year old company cannot issue sweat equity shares for more than 15% of its existing paid up capital so let's say if the paid up capital is 100 crore paid up equity share capital then they cannot issue sweat equity shares more than of 15 crore more than 15% in a year or shares the value of inr uh, indian rupee 5 crore so so in a year they can at most issue 15% of their share, uh, paid up capital as sweat equity shares or 5 crore which is higher right so if 15% comes up uh, comes out to be higher than 5 crore then 5 crore is the limit also this issuance of sweat equity in the company cannot exceed 25% of the paid up capital at any time so this limit is for 1 year and this is the permanent limit that at max at one time at most 25% shares of a company should be issued as sweat equity shares not more than that but the rules are little relaxed for startup as they may issue sweat equity shares not exceeding 50% of the paid up capital up to 5 years from the date of its commencement or from the date of its incorporation and after that after 5 years it would have to follow these rules these two rules right so this is sweat equity shares so guys sweat equity shares are usually confused with 
employee stock option program so we recently discussed esops in one of our session see they are quite similar because they both act as reward for employees but there are some operational differences right in sweat equity shares usually the consideration is other than cash right and in case of eso but in case of eso the money is taken from the employee right plus esops are more relaxed because there are many restrictions on uh, sweat equity shares and such restrictions are not there on employee stock option program right so see esop are like, are like providing them with some financial gain but with the the, the rationale behind sweat equity shares is to reward them for their compensation right here esop is an additional thing apart from their compensation whereas this is sweat equity shares is is something which is considered a part of their compensation right okay sweat equity shares they usually have a lock in period so you uh, it is up to you guys now you have to search and let me know in the comments that what is the lock in period for sweat equity shares right so moving away to the last question for today this is the last question which says rbi has recently come up with some decisions regarding qr code infrastructure according to this which qr code has been barred by rbi from being launched by any payment system operator moving ahead to the solution and the solution is option b proprietary qr so rbi has recently come up with some norms from for the payment system operators i think we have discussed this term in one of our previous session payment system operator means any entity which is responsible for taking care of the process of a payment right who has the responsibility to get a payment transaction fulfilled or completed and guys we had one special session in which we talked about a report uh, on uh, the a report which is finalized under this issue so there was a report rbi put it up on the website for inviting recommendations and now they have come up with some final rules right so we discussed that report in uh, in that session and in that session we discussed about these terms different type of qr codes what are qr codes right their types and Uh, whether they are interoperable or not, and what is the significance of being interoperable? So I would suggest to you that before attempting this question, uh, do watch that session. That is going to help you. Okay. So now RBI is saying that no payment system operator is going to issue a proprietary QR code. So what is meant by proprietary QR code? Proprietary co QR code is issued by one organization so if all the different payment system operators they are going to issue their own codes then the customer would have to put a different app in their phone for every payment mode right so that is why rbi wants to promote qr codes which are interoperable interoperable means that that customer can use only one uh, one app to to scan that code and then make the transaction right so it doesn't matter who is the payment system operator they can use a combined or a unified qr code right so that is why rbi is saying no one is going to issue proprietary qr because it belongs to one payment system operator or unique to every payment system operator talking about some other rules two interoperable qr codes which are in existing existence currently upi qr bharat qr So these terms have been discussed. These types have been discussed in that session. Payment system operators use proprietary QR shall shift to one or more interoperable QR, and they are saying that PSOs who are currently using proprietary QR, they are going to shift to some interoperable QR codes. Process of migration shall be completed by March thirty one two thousand twenty two. There is a deadline for shifting to interoperable codes. No new proprietary code. and after that unique code unique qr code forces a customer to maintain different apps as i just told you that if we are going to have a lot of proprietary qr codes then it is going to be difficult for customers so new norms will remove the need to maintain different app so that the transaction is simple or hassle free for the user 
and use of one QR code through which all payments can be made across merchants, right? And it is difficult for merchants also because they have then they have to get into touch with different payment system operators, then get a QR code. It is difficult for them also, right? So, guys, these were the five questions for today. And after this, so yesterday there was a technical glitch in the session because of which question number fifth. It was not properly visible to you guys. Here you can see the correct question and the tables related to it. So we discussed the uh, rules that RBI came up with for the housing finance companies in yesterday's session. I hope that was clear. And here is a table for fulfilling the criteria of minimum percentage of assets into housing finance company. This was the table which covers the liquidity coverage ratio, uh, the deadlines for liquidity coverage ratio, right? So you can take a screenshot of it for further use. Okay, so guys, this is it for today. And I hope you find this session beneficial. And if you do, then do not forget to give us a thumbs up because I'll be back in the next session discussing some more thing, things, uh, information with you guys. So till then, you take care of yourselves, keep your studies going on. And I'll see you in the next session. Thank you for being here.